Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation on motive grafting and scaffolding using Rosetta. My name is Clara and I've been part of the Mila lab for the last three years and this is exactly the topic I've been doing some research on and been using these methods. Today I mostly want to focus on making you aware of the methods that are available and also telling a little bit about when is it good to use which method. And to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about, we're going to have a short introduction on why do we do grafting, and then we're going to be discussing sidechain and backbone grafting, which are the like two most well-known protocols. And then we're going to have a second section, which you also already can jump to, um, where we look at more advanced options. Fun for design is part of our tutorial, and the other things. Just want to tell them, tell you that these are there. And maybe one day you're going to be looking at them and being like interested in using one of these. So why do we do grafting? And what do we actually understand when we say grafting? So mode of grafting is the transplantation of a functional site of a protein onto another protein. This functional site can be a peptide, can be side chains, can be like a stretch of backbone, can be discontinuous stretches of backbones. Um, this has mostly been uh, used in immunological applications, and this is also where these protocols are coming from. Especially in the context of viral glycoproteins, people have been interested in studying isolated epitopes. However, these viral glycoproteins carry like 5, 6, or 10, or 12 different epitopes, so it's really hard to study just uh, the immune response to one of them. And in order to achieve that, you take this one epitope and you graft it onto a scaffold protein, and then you have it isolated on like a scaffold protein. And this is also where people have been developing step-by-step step these very different methods. You can also imagine what's useful for is um, designing um, flexible peptides in the context of a scaffold to stabilize a certain conformation, which could give you a high boost in binding. This figure is taken from um, a, um, a paper called Proof of Principle of epitope focused Vaccine Design, where a method has been introduced how to transplant a motive, in this case, this yellow um, epitope of the respiratory syncytial virus, uh, prefusion protein F, which was co-crystallized in, um, in a complex structure with an antibody. And this motive was taken and grafted onto a scaffold topology. And today we're going to um, talk about which methods are available to achieve exactly these things. And by the end of the talk, you're going to be known which method you would use to do exactly what they've been doing here. Um, in that paper, it's actually really nicely worked. They identified a design where they could stabilize uh, the, the conformation of uh, the epitope in a scaffold protein and use it for immunization and got a really good boost in the antibodies that they were interested in. This is an overview of the available protocols. <laughs> so it's really interesting uh, to understand how they're implemented. Um, the four things we're going to be talking about today are sidechain grafting, backbone grafting, Fold design, which is um, has been known as fold from loops before, and uh, then we're going to briefly mention Rosetta Remodel. So the first three protocols are implemented on Rosetta scripts, which makes it really easy for us to modify these protocols and use them in other contexts. Um, the first to use as a mover is the core of the thing that uh, Rosetta actually um, applying to the pose and which is doing the back work of the protocol. Um, that's the motive graph mover in this case. Uh, Funful Design uses the loop initio mover, and we're going to be looking at this more closely in our tutorial. Rosetta Remodel is an application, um, so it has to be used on the command line with options. Um, it's not as easy to modify these workflows as compared to Rosetta scripts. So, talking about sidechain and backbone grafting. Um, you can see like a basic workflow of these protocols here. We have to define a motive in context of another protein, which is the binder is the context of the motive. In this case, um, it's a little peptide that's binding to the estrogen receptor alpha that we are interested in. And you can also already see uh, side chains um, that are here displayed. This is especially interacting residues that we are interested in. In both protocols, what you're also going to be using is a scaffold um, database. This is what you're going to be grafting on. A very important step in a protocol is the matching of the scaffold backbones. And then 
it's either going to be side chain grafting where you only transplant these hotspot residues, or it's going to be backbone grafting where you really take the whole stretch of the backbone and incorporate it into the backbone of your scaffold library. In both cases, there's obviously some scoring, filtering, and redesigning necessary afterwards um, to incorporate the modem correctly. This is also all very nicely described in this paper that's um, listed below here. One word about the scaffold library is this is a very important step. You really want to be using high-resolution diffraction data, um, at least 2.5 angstrom, better like 2.0 angstrom, because you really want to make sure that the backbone of your lining, it is actually in space there where you say it's there because you you are dependent on your very well aligned protein backbone. Um, most of the times you're downloading these things from the protein database and you have options there to also modify your search. And it could, for example, be that you are interested in proteins that are expressed from E. coli because it's the system that you will be using. And you can already, in, in this step, define and only select proteins that have been known to be expressed from E. coli. Important for what these protocols are, it has to be a single chain protein with no bound ligands and no modified residues. And also something very important, before you use it, relax your scaffold database so Rosetta can use it appropriately during the protocol. This is how a scaffold library looks like. This is from the tutorial. As you kind of already seen in our tutorial, the motive is on a helical stretch, so it's most likely to be transplanted onto um, a helical scaffold protein, and you find a selection of these in our scaffold library. This is the Rotosetta Scripts protocol of sidechain grafting. The very important part is here in the middle um, that is marked in bold. This is where the mode of graft mover is displayed, and um, <clears throat> you can see what we need to define for this protocol. So you, we will have to define a context PDB. This is the binder, so we are normally using core crystal structures um, for, as an input. And uh, from these core crystal structures, the binder will be the context. The motive, as you have defined it in your motive PDB, that's, that's the portion of the protein that we're interested in in transplanting. It's noteworthy that in side chain grafting, the RMST tolerances are relatively low. And um, there are also some other tests the protocol does in order to validate a scaffold for suitable for side chain grafting. Very important, these are the options that you'll, you'll have to know that they, they've set been to true. It's the full mode of backbone alignment, means my motive is fully aligned to the backbone of the scaffold. Then it's graft only hotspots by replacement, set to true. And this is why it's very important to define what are my hotspots residues. Because what's going to be happening is only the hotspot residues um, will be transplanted onto the backbone of the scaffold. And then there's the option to revert graft to native sequence, which means that everything that's not a hotspot will be reverted to the native sequence of your scaffold protein. Obviously, then you're going to have some post-processing, some repacking, some minimizing, which is important for your pose. This is how it's looking like um, in our example from the tutorial. So we have this helical um, little peptide in the context of this um, of this here in green uh, displayed uh, estrogen receptor, and you can see these intacting residues. And this is relatively helical. Keep this in mind when you're like looking at your designs. And to really define, this is something that you have to define in the protocol. What exactly is my motive, and what is my context? And in this case, this um, little peptide will be um, the motive, and as hotspot residues. I would define these interacting residues. There are obviously options on how to identify hotspot residues. Um, here it's relatively obvious that it's going to be these two residues. And the estrogen receptor will be defined as the context. That's important to keep the motive in the right backbone um, geometry. This is something how it's looking like after side chain grafting. You can find some examples here. So A is our input structure. And then you can see in all the following um, uh, figures how the side chains have been grafted onto these helical scaffold proteins. And you can really nicely see down here in this uh, figure G how both these interacting residues have been transplanted onto the helical stretches. And they look very much like they looked on the peptide. 
Something you can also already see is you have to do some um, post uh, process scoring and um, like plotting and analyzing. Something that is probably worth looking at, especially when you're talking about the binder, is the interface energy, which should be just as good if you have um, your, your graft, or it should even be better because you can create more interactions with the protein. Coming to backbone grafting, this principle is a little different. So we again have a target scaffold, and we again have a more different context with um, the binder. However, in this case, we don't want to do a full alignment to the backbone of the scaffold. Most um, likely this is the case because it's going to be really, really hard finding a matching backbone. What's happening here is that the end and C terminal residues of the of the motif are aligned to the scaffold backbone. Then the intermediate residues are discarded from the scaffold, and uh, through loop closure your motive is um, transplanted and there's some sequence designed to incorporate the backbone completely into the scaffold and allow to stabilize it. So that's the principle of backbone grafting. Um, as you, this is an example from, from the literature and you can see that um, here the interacting residues are just, they have a pretty wide backbone geometry. It's gonna be really hard finding a scaffold library for this or even more than one option. So in these cases, backbone grafting is really your method of choice. You're probably gonna have not much other choices. Um, you again have to um, create a scaffold um, library and do a scaffold search. But here's only uh, the NLC terminals and you can see how it actually allows for both the discontinuous epitope grafting and it also really changes the backbone geometry. As this is an example from, from the literature, um, you can appreciate it actually worked here. Something you can also see is like a lot of these methods really perform well in um, iteratively with directed evolution. So you identify a scaffold that is binding to um, your, like your antibody, for example, and then there's a lot of optimization going on on these scaffolds. Looking at the protocol, it looks very much like uh, the sidechain grafting protocol. Um, again, you have to define context and motive. However, some of the options of the motive graph mover are a little different here. So as we already said, we don't want to do a full backbone alignment and this is why full motive backbone alignment is set to zero. And we also don't only want to graft our hotspot residues. No, we want to graft them all. So this is why graft only hotspots by replacement is set to zero. This is from the example that we also will be using in our tutorial. Um, this uh, could be some outputs that you're going to be looking at. Um, so something you, you can see already is like uh, this helical uh, portion that we had in the peptide that was grafted onto helices before. He is really grafted into a loop. So this is a very different backbone um, of the scaffold compared to our motive. And you can see this in a close up down here. Um, and you can really see how uh, the motive replaces the scaffold backbone. Something that you should keep in mind is that these are design protocols and there are going to be a lot of sampling and scoring and analyzing necessary in order to achieve um, good designs. So you could, for example, look at binding energy and shape complementarity. There are a lot of other options you could be looking at. There's definitely things you want to discard, especially if your protein isn't well packed. And Rosetta offers you a lot of options to look at this, um, and you really should if you're running these design protocols. Also make sure that you're really designing a lot of sequences that also have some diversity. There's also this rule of thumb. Try to um, make as few mutations as possible, because the more mutations you, you're trying to make, um, the less likely it's going to be that you're not disrupting the fold of a protein. And this is why, especially in sidechain grafting, you want to keep it simple to start with. And there's um, yeah, a lot of options how you can compare this, and it's really necessary if you're running this. Also, you are the expert on your project. There's probably some knowledge-based uh, facts that you are aware of that you want to take into consideration for your specific purpose. 
So let's compare these two um, uh, these two methods, um, sidechain grafting and backbone grafting, when you can employ which. Sidechain grafting is only employable if you have a very low backbone RBSD. Uh, if that's the case, it's normally a, a very defined secondary structure. And um, you have to have a lot of scaffolds available. So scaffold availability is definitely a sidechain grafting problem. As you are using a background geometry very closely to your motive and very closely to the scaffold, there's a lot of confidence that this is actually not disrupting the fold. So the, there's definitely the advantage of that the likelihood that this is correctly folding as pressing is higher. And backbone grafting, you mostly want to employ it if you have more challenging backbones, discontinuous epitopes, and also if you don't have many scaffolds available. It is less dependent on scaffolds, however, you're still going to need them. And this is also, again, um, like a, a drawback of these protocols. Like, if you don't have a scaffold, it's going to be very hard using these methods. Also, for background grafting, I would highly advise doing more sampling and more analyzing and testing. So to sum this up, we have to find mode of context and hotspots, which is very important in these protocols. We have been talking about a scaffold library, which is necessary. Um, you can like create one or search for scaffolds, so there are different options for that. Sidechain grafting really maintains the backbone coordinates and is really likely to keep the backbone geometry correctly. Backbone grafting will tolerate more scaffolds and is more versatile. It basically uses the same mover in the protocol. It has just different options. In both cases, analyzing and filtering steps are very necessary and should be employed to select uh, foldable designs. And with this, we're going to be heading into the uh, second section of our talk.